Thanks for joining us at Team London Bridge for something we've been really excited about for quite some time. And uh, thanks, Brigade, for letting us use this amazing space twice now for this amazing turnout. Um, Kwai Chi, our great speaker over here, has um, developed quite a reputation for himself as being a, an authority in social media. And he's spoken at some of the biggest social media events in London. So we're really excited to have him again. I know he's really excited to talk to you. So we're going to go ahead and have Allison from Brigade start off and talk a bit about what they do and their social media strategy. And then Kwai will present, um, followed by Q&A. And for anyone who wants to stick around afterward, um, uh, Total Media representatives will be available for one-to-ones. And don't forget to comment and ask questions at TLB, hashtag TLB social on Twitter. So thanks. Good morning, everyone. Is everybody awake? Has everybody had lots of coffee? Yeah. And everyone going to ask lots of questions at the end? Excellent, because he's amazing. I saw him last week. We sent the invitation out for an event, and we had 97 responses within 10 minutes of it going out. So well done. You're the successful second half of the group. <laughs> um, my name's Alison, and I, I'm lucky enough to work um, with Beyond Food Foundation and PwC in a joint venture at Brigade. We have an exciting 14 apprentices that go through a six-week program, sorry, six-month program, and they are people that are from Thames Reach, and they've experienced homeless or very much on the homeless front. We actually engage with them through a, working with us for two days a week. They go to college three days a week, and at the end of six months, they graduate, and they get an MVQ level two in cookery skills, and we place them in fantastic places like De Vere, Rhinefield House, Raymond Blanc's venues. So that's the reason for coming to eat at Brigade, because we are a social enterprise initiative. So money we raise here goes back into charity fund and actually distills within the Beyond Food Foundation and goes out towards people that are less advantaged than ourselves. So, show of hands, who's actually eaten at Brigade? Ah, better than last week. Thank you very much. The rest of you, shame on you. We'd love to see you back. We've just introduced our new spring menu, and I have the unfortunate job of whining and dining clients and making sure that my diet and my dress size goes up and down like a yo-yo. We've just launched a new white bottle of Lancelon champagne. Damn, I have to try that too. So, if you're holding any networking events, we love Team London Bridge and we're very excited to have you here today. I can't ex express our um, thanks to them for actually gaining your time this morning and I don't want to take up too much time but I know social media is very important it's the route to market and it's the quick way of sending emails and also looking at how we can communicate out there to people who don't know us or who we want to keep in touch with for me I've been in hospitality for over 20 years now social media is very important but it's also very important for me to meet with everybody and say hello as well I have a couple of colleagues here today Amy Costello, have a wave. She's our events coordinator here. And we have exciting things upstairs, like a cook school. So if you want to do a little bit of team bonding, the best part is always start in the kitchen. So why not network with your work colleagues and book an event upstairs for networking in the kitchen and creating the food that you will eat afterwards. We also have private dining rooms and meeting space. That's the sales pitch over. I also have Sandra from our sister venue at Canary Wharf, because we're part of Devere Venues, which have 42 locations in the UK. So we're around afterwards as well. So any weekend breaks or meetings, hi. Um, I will hand you over now and say thank you very much. And we'll see you for lunch next week. Brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much again uh, to Brigade Bar. Um, thanks for having me again. Thanks for coming down. Uh, the weather is a bit crap outside. So uh, I'm very glad you all made it this morning. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, not too long today about how to be an online trendsetter. Uh, some housekeeping things. Uh, if you would like to communicate with us, uh, ask us any questions throughout the, um, uh, the session, uh, then feel free to go onto Twitter. Uh, if you go and find Brigade Bar on the Wi-Fi here, uh, just fill in your email address, um, your telephone number, and uh, Brigade as a password, you'll be hooked up to the Wi-Fi here, so you don't even have to use your 3G minutes. Um, uh, our hashtag today is uh, TLB Social. Uh, we also have WhatsApp available, so uh, if you don't want to uh, go online, uh, but you just want to use your phone, if you have WhatsApp, uh, then use the phone number that you see there. Uh, the phone number is also on all your tables uh, with my name and details uh, next to Total Media. looks a bit like this. And also, uh, if you have a new phone uh, uh, made this year, 
uh, which is an Android device, a BlackBerry device, or Windows mobile device made by Nokia, uh, then it will probably have NFC enabled on it. Um, if you do, uh, then you can just tap your phone next to a tag which is on your table and it will connect you uh, to our Twitter feed. So, uh, hands up here who has a new phone. Anyone who has a new phone made this year? Three, four, five people. Wow. That's a good start. Okay. So, I see I'm an, a very early adopter um, and... Uh, uh, that's one of the things which, which keeps me going, keeps me motivated in this social space. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, what's uh, right here, right now, things you need to actually be doing in the social space, things you need to be doing much further afield uh, past that point and what's likely to happen in the future. I'll be taking a lot of crazy punts, um, so uh, uh, a lot of the punts will probably become true, I, fingers crossed, so in 10 years' time you can quote me and go, hey, Kwai Chi coined this, Kwai Chi coined this. Um, or, or I will get it completely wrong, in which case no one will ever remember, which is, which is great. Um, I will also uh, finish up with focusing on the Olympics, uh, what you can and what you can't do, um, and uh, then I'll be available for questions. Um, like I said, if you've got any questions at all throughout the session, uh, feel free to tweet it. Uh, or if you want to stay old school, you can actually put your hand up at the end of the session and ask me a question in real life. Everyone cool with that? Excellent. So, um, just a little roadmap of, uh, of social media, or, or the internet actually. Um, back all the way back in 1979, uh, a company called CompuServe um, created the first internet service provider with customer support. Uh, there wasn't much of a need for it because uh, the PC wasn't really invented until two years later. So CompuServe were really uh, ahead of the game uh, back then. Um, uh, something that you may have heard of called uh, Firefox, a, a web browser today, uh, originally started all the way back in 1981, the year I was born, um, uh, in a, a thing called Mosaic uh, over there. So uh, they made... Um, uh, Mosaic, it was the first uh, web uh, browser with a graphical interface. Uh, before that, it was very, very um, uh, DOSy. Uh, I don't remember if anyone remembers DOS, uh, where you have like a command line and, oh, okay. My, my tech geek side coming out of me there. Um, a bit further down the line, uh, we had IRC, the first chat rooms uh, to come alive. Uh, all the way back in 1995, that's this uh, little Pac-Man looking guy over here. Uh, so uh, that was kind of the birth of chat rooms and it was popularised by AOL uh, with their instant messenger service uh, just a couple of years later. Uh, Napster, uh, something that Sean Parker started up, uh, came soon afterwards and closed down just two years later. Uh, there was quite a big gap in the dot-com boom era. Um, and then along came uh, MySpace in 2003, uh, followed by Twitter, Bebo, YouTube and Facebook, all around 2005, 2006. So a lot of people feel that those are actually quite new social networks. They've actually been around for six, seven years now. Um, th this was the original Twitter logo. I thought that would be quite uh, interesting for you all to see. Um, very, very different to the Tweety Bird that we see today. Uh, and today we've got things like GetGlue, Pinterest, Google+, which I'll go into uh, later. So, uh, looking at right now, um, what can you do? What can you kind of get activated in your business uh, for, to build a better strategy? Uh, first of all, blog. It's such a simple thing. Uh, a lot of you guys already do it. Um, but a lot of you guys probably don't. Um, it's really important to have uh, sustainable content that uh, allows uh, your viewers to get updated with new information all the time. Uh, there are several reasons to have a blog, uh, either on your own domain name or uh, a blog server like uh, Tumblr uh, or uh, Blogger, uh, which is made by uh, Google. And um, uh, one of those reasons is uh, your search ranking. So uh, if somebody finds you and types in your brand name on Google, uh, it'll probably come up near the top on, on the first page. Uh, but if you have a blog, 
uh, that will take, say, position two. Uh, if you have a blog on Tumblr two, then you have position three, four. Uh, and we call that SERPs, um, your, your position on, on Google. And it's really important to try and uh, take out, knock out as much of that kind of Google real estate as possible. So um, make it interesting. Uh, don't make uh, kind of boring, benign things to talk about. Uh, find something interesting uh, that's focused around your company. It's, it's really important to have uh, something that is vital or interesting. So for something like Brigade Bar, they can talk about uh, the charity uh, that they, they run here with the Fulton Apprentices. Uh, maybe uh, the Fulton Apprentices can run their own sub-blog uh, in the blog, for instance. So um, there are lots of kind of different mechanisms you can use uh, to deploy uh, a really good, successful, readable blog. Um, the next uh, one is uh, Twitter. Uh, a lot of you guys, again, have got Twitter. Uh, it's really important uh, to engage with people uh, on this platform, if possible. It's one of the quickest one-to-one -one mediums um, uh, in, in social media, much, much faster than something like Facebook. Um, you can also now advertise on Twitter. So we're one of the UK's first uh, partners for Twitter. Um, we ran a campaign recently for... Uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, which is a, an S&M book, uh, something that we can't normally advertise on a billboard uh, poster um, out in the middle of uh, High Street, Kensington. Uh, so uh, one thing we did to kind of really activate uh, the community uh, was find people and target people who were uh, interested in S&M content uh, or people who were uh, interested in um, this particular author. Uh, and we just did a promoted tweet with an engagement strategy behind it. It's really, really important that if you ever do any media spend at all uh, on social media channels, it's really, really vital that you have an engagement strategy on the end of it. Um, otherwise, you'll have, say, uh, 20,000 new followers on Twitter, and you have nothing to do with them straight after your campaign. It's such a fantastic tool to keep people engaged, uh, not just now, but forever. Um, Okay, so next up, Facebook. Uh, Facebook changed the timeline end of February, last day of February, uh, for all brands. Uh, so now every person, every brand is in this new timeline layout. Uh, and one of the really cool things that a lot of brands have done this year um, is get really, really visual uh, with what, they, what they're about. Uh, and they've used the date uh, mechanism really, really effectively as well. So uh, lots of brands like Levi's, Coca-Cola, uh, my football team, Arsenal, I realise I'm in the wrong place of, uh, of London to support Arsenal. Ooh, okay, fine. Um, um, but uh, they, they have all used uh, the kind of date of birth of, of uh, their particular brand, company, service, um, and actually focus content around that uh, uh, era. So here, Arsenal, um, the person who invented Arsenal Football Club, uh, all the way back in 1886, that is featured on Facebook. So you could virtually make a Wikipedia, um, a brand Wikipedia on Facebook of yourself, of your brand. Uh, a lot of brands have decided to do uh, uh, sub pages as well on Facebook uh, where they can focus uh, campaign related content uh, using this kind of timeline mechanism. Uh, the other thing that's changed alongside uh, timeline for brands uh, is the uh, extra creator space you ha now have on uh, Facebook apps. So um, as a business, uh, you can create a Facebook app, you host it on your own servers. It's absolutely uh, free for you to utilize. Um, it's not free for you to uh, advertise to uh, using Facebook ads, um, but it's something that you can keep engaged with your community. Uh, with any Facebook app, if you are spending a, a lot of money uh, to kind of build something uh, make sure it's really engaging. Make sure uh, that it's something that people will want to reuse over and over again, rather than uh, a simple mechanic that gets used for one campaign and then gets flushed out. Uh, so I've got an example here from Unilever. They ran the Unilever VIP campaign recently, uh, which is now uh, ended. But during the campaign itself, um, they ran a league um, between all the uh, users of the Unilever VIP scheme. And what they wanted to get out of people was feedback on what they could develop with their products, what they were um, doing right, what were they doing wrong, or what they could improve on. Um, and the, most co uh, the people who contributed most uh, were given more points. Uh, and the people at the end of each month who had the most points won prizes. Um, it's a 
quite a simple mechanic, um, but it's just kind of one step extra to a simple uh, data capture competition mechanic where you win some champagne, for instance. Um, so it's really, really important to get that knuckled down. Uh, the next one, a lot of people kind of been asking me, uh, shall I get on Google Plus? Well, uh, I say yes, absolutely. For the same reason as your blog, for instance, uh, a uh, reason why you would have a blog to, to uh, reserve a position on Google. Uh, Google Plus uh, effectively does the same thing. Um, Google Plus uh, gives a preference uh, to brands who use Google Plus. Um, and it's also really important to actually reserve your name so that a competitor or someone else uh, doesn't take it first. It, it, that's the same for any new social media network. So if you see anything new uh, on the market, make sure you go and block out the name for your brand or your company, and even yourself. Um, uh, annoyingly, uh, all the way back in uh, 2003, when I first went onto MySpace, I found that there was another Kwai Chi already on MySpace. I was like, oh, I can't have myspace.com forward slash Kwai Chi. This is so annoying. Um, so it's really important that if you don't want to be Kwai Chi 1 or Kwai Chi 2, uh, that you actually reserve that name beforehand. It's really, really important. So uh, Google+, Plus. Uh, the other reason why it's really important to get onto this platform is because they're starting to integrate a lot more things into Google+, Plus, into this platform. So things like uh, the photo sharing site, Picasa in the past, uh, used to be a standalone site, used to be a standalone service. Now if you go to picasa.com, it's been completely integrated into Google+, Plus, into the photo section here on the left. So it's really, really vital that you get onto that. Um, there are extra additional features that you won't find on any other social media network as well. Uh, if you want to have a, a focus group, uh, a small focus group, say of nine, ten people, then you can run a video hangout uh, with um, those particular people. You can create a bespoke circle uh, using uh, the Google Circle uh, mechanism, and you can talk to a very small focus group uh, and get direct feedback in real time uh, about what you can do on, on, um, for your particular brand and get direct feedback. Um, there are other assets to take hold of as well, which a lot of brands don't use. Uh, that is uh, things like your profile image uh, and the header banner. Uh, the header banner's changed now, so uh, as well as just being able to have five separate images, uh, you can also have a really long uh, positive image. So do take a look around, check out Google+. It is a very, very nice um, kind of uh, user interface. Uh, and it's something that um, I foresee something like YouTube uh, getting pulled into automatically in the future. Um, there, also, there already is a placeholder here uh, for videos. Uh, currently, if you try to uh, uh, go to that and upload a video, it doesn't give you many options to do so. So I see that as a natural move for Google Next to push its top social media uh, network outside of Google Plus uh, into the Google Plus ecosphere. It's really important for future pay-per-click adverts as well. If you do any Google ads, uh, a lot of the uh, ads, uh, the featured ads in the future, will take you directly to a Google Plus page, uh, and you'll be incentivized to do that as well. Um, there's going to be things like uh, video adverts on, on PPC and feature-rich, uh, content-led uh, PPC ads on Google. So. Uh, it's really important that you get onto Google Plus now, reserve your name, uh, and also start using it so you know what the pros and cons are of that particular platform. Uh, next up, if you are uh, location-based, then it's really important to get all your uh, info correct. So uh, one of my favorite restaurants in the world has gone downhill uh, uh, this year. Uh, they just released the 50 top restaurants in the world. Uh, and Fat Duck went from something like number two or three to 13, but it's still a big favorite of mine. And one thing they do really well is make sure that they get their opening hours, uh, the kind of food, the description, the location, uh, correct everywhere. So uh, whether it's a Zagat or a TripAdvisor or a Google Places, uh, they have their information tidied up everywhere. So it's quite formalized, uh, it's always up to date and it's always correct. Uh, you know how to book a ticket, or not a ticket, a seat, uh, and you know the mechanism for uh, uh, getting there or uh, how to find them. And it's really important you do that 
uh, because uh, you'll find that Google actually aggregates a lot of this data from different places. Uh, and if you have different information in different places, it can't aggregate that data properly. So uh, to give you an example, if you look at the Google reviews, um, it does collate and aggregate all the data from around the internet. So it pulls data from zagat.com, a food review site that Google actually owns and runs, uh, TripAdvisor, uh, and Urban Spoon. Uh, they do aggregate all the other food services as well, but um, these three are uh, the kind of the three big ones at the moment. Uh, a lot of you probably will never heard of Urban Spoon. Uh, they're very uh, American, but a lot of you will have heard of uh, Zega and definitely probably TripAdvisor. So it's really important that you engage on those particular uh, channels if you have a, a relevant kind of uh, service. Uh, if you don't, then it's good to find out what those relevant uh, networks are for your service. It's not just about uh, having the correct details on Google Plus and Facebook and Twitter. Uh, you have to extend that network out to what's right for your business uh, and what's relevant. Uh, it's also really important uh, never to piss off your customers. If you have uh, a restaurant like this, uh, it's really, really important uh, to have uh, an outstanding service and outstanding food for every single customer. Otherwise, you get bad feedback like this. So even Fat Duck has bad feedback. Um, and one of the reasons for that uh, bad feedback these days is the immediacy of being able to give uh, poor feedback directly to uh, a restaurant uh, now that we are completely mobile. So uh, most of you have smartphones, I can see around, uh, lots of iPhones, a few Android devices. Um, and it's really important um, that uh, you know, if you're an Android uh, user, you can go to Google Places, you can check out what's uh, near you, uh, what the best restaurants are, what the best pubs and clubs are. Um, uh, if you're uh, an iPhone, uh, you can just log into your TripAdvisor app and you can see, again, uh, what's good around exactly where you are right now. Uh, and when you're at that venue, you can give immediate feedback uh, as to how your experience was. You no longer have to wait till you get home and go, oh, I can't be bothered to leave a review. You can do it right there and then. So it's really, really important to make sure that the core values of your own business are sorted uh, at, as well as kind of sorting out a really good social media uh, campaign. Um, now, going on to a good social media campaign, uh, Nike in Copenhagen uh, wanted to show off the fact that you could customize uh, your shoes using Nike ID, a new feature in Copenhagen at the time. Uh, and one thing they did was to activate the Facebook community uh, by allowing people to pick colors for different portions of the shoe. Uh, the most popular ones got painted by graffiti artists live onto uh, a billboard in the middle of uh, Copenhagen. And uh, once the shoe was complete on the billboard, uh, it went back onto Facebook and allowed people, allowed the Facebook fans uh, to actually go and purchase that shoe that they had crowdsourced and built together. Uh, if they didn't like that shoe, uh, they could go and just customize their own shoe and purchase their own shoe. So you can see there's a kind of a, a cycle there where you can close a loop uh, between starting a creative campaign uh, and then actually turning it into a real life sale, doing something very, very creative and fairly left field. Um, one thing I do hear a lot of um, in this industry is something called uh, sentiment scoring. And uh, it's really important that uh, you don't get oversold on this kind of stuff. Um, there are companies like Radian 6, Sysmos, Synthesio uh, who focus uh, all of their kind of marketing sales strategy to uh, kind of telling you and, and informing you that you really need to know uh, what your fans think about you. Personally, I think it's much better to actually engage on those channels and spend your money uh, actually having somebody look at, looking and monitoring at your content and what people are saying about you so you can actually react in real time to it. Um, the, uh, what sentiment tracking is or sentiment scoring is, is if you have, a, say, a benign comment like, um, I'm going to Brigade Bar today. Um, if you have five people in a room uh, put in together, this is a real life experiment, um, only four out of the five people will agree whether that is a positive comment, a neutral comment, or a negative comment. 
So these things try to do it automatically. They have uh, algorithms where they try to uh, explain how positive how, uh, or how negative a comment is. Uh, and they score completely differently to one another. Uh, and what you'll find with most brands, especially brands with um, low conversation, uh, when I say low, you know, you're talking up to the hundreds and thousands of conversations per month, um, then this kind of sentiment scoring won't really change month on month uh, unless you have a very, very controversial brand. Um, if it starts getting very, very big, then it changes a bit. You can start using this to kind of monitor what people are saying and how much people are talking about you. But again, I would have caution about how uh, these things actually score uh, what you do. Um, after all, if I'm going to Brigade Bar, it could mean that, uh, a number of things. It could be something uh, uh, really negative, um, that I, I'm coming here. It could be a really bad place. It's not. <laughs> uh, or uh, it could be a really good place, uh, and I'm really happy to come here. It's really difficult for a, a robot to understand uh, the, the meaning behind that. Uh, so uh, throw caution to win there. Um, the final thing for this section is uh, believe in your consumer. Uh, over and above everything else, put the consumer at the heart of everything that you run, all the campaign ideas that you have. Uh, lead it through um, the shoes of the consumer. Put yourself in their boots and actually walk through the whole user journey and actually experience it for yourself. Is it a good mechanism? Uh, is it a, a good app? Am I going to realistically come back and reuse this over and over again? Do I really love this? Do I not love this? If you don't, then probably lots of other people won't either. So it's really important um, when you come up with any campaign ideas to place consumer at the heart of everything. It's really, really important because um, too many brands out there uh, focus on what they want to sell or what they want to get out of uh, a campaign. Uh, looking at numbers straight out and uh, going, okay, I want uh, a two pound uh, per lead uh, ROI um, uh, before they think of anything, before they kind of look at any kind of user experience. It's really important to start um, and finish with the user uh, at the heart of everything in, in that user journey instead. Uh, that way you'll find that that ROI will actually be a lot lower uh, than if you started with that as a centre focus of your campaign. So, looking to the future, uh, this is uh, quite cheap punt time. So, uh, there's a, a lot that's going to be uh, happening in the future. Um, and uh, something that's happened very recently is that Facebook uh, bought out uh, Instagram. Hands up who's uh, got Instagram and used it here. Brilliant. Okay, that's at least half the room. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, used Instagram before, uh, it's a photo sharing app which allows you a one-touch operation to uh, manipulate your photos uh, and upload them to Facebook for your friends to see and share. Now, uh, Facebook bought uh, Instagram recently for $1 billion. Uh, that's a huge, huge amount of money uh, for an application uh, that runs on an iPhone or an Android device. Um, uh, Zuckerberg did kind of buy this uh, without um, his directors getting involved, something that he won't be able to do after their IPO uh, on May 17th or 24th, um, because he will have to have the backing of uh, all the directors before he can make uh, decisions like this. It's a huge, huge ticket item uh, to kind of go ahead and purchase, uh, but I do see him um, doing uh, more kind of rational uh, uh, buying uh, but one of the reasons why he did buy uh, Instagram was because Twitter uh, were in the hunt to actually purchase this for their platform. Uh, and you'll see a lot more of that for the next 12 to 36 months, where a lot of the main platforms, Google+, uh, Facebook and Twitter, will be vying uh, for apps like Fiddy, uh, uh, an app which is very much like Instagram, but for video content. So. Uh, this is a natural fit as an extension to something like Instagram for Facebook. Uh, it's also a natural progression for uh, people like um, uh, YouTube, uh, for Google. Uh, so you can see there's going to be a, a real tussle in the future for who buys what and uh, who gets first dibs. So uh, 
The future is really, really uh, interesting in this kind of space at the moment. Um, uh, the Spotify recently did uh, a deal uh, with Coca-Cola. So Spotify will be running all of uh, Coca-Cola's future uh, music services. And again, Spotify have a very, very close relationship with Facebook. Um, Sean Parker, uh, who is a, a major backer of Spotify, was the first president at Facebook. Uh, so he was in early doors. They have a lot of integration between the platforms. Um, and what this means for you, as well as kind of looking at very audio-led content on Facebook, and on Instagram and video and YouTube, uh, you'll also be able to uh, advertise, you'll find more opportunities to advertise on audio methods as well. So uh, originally you, you were thinking about uh, engaging with consumers through uh, copy style content, things you write down on Twitter, on your Facebook wall, um, but now everything is very, sh very much shifting towards visual aids and audio uh, mediums too. Um, one thing to bear in mind is that if Facebook do buy Spotify, um, would you want to be associated with a brand like Coca-Cola, a brand that can sometimes be controversial, um, if it's uh, playing an advert every other song, um, with you kind of interjecting in between? Uh, it's something to consider from a kind of a, a brand overview, um, and it's something to kind of uh, assess if you're running uh, any kind of non visual, non-copy campaign. Uh, do you want to use something like Spotify, or are you going to choose uh, another platform like Audioboo, uh, or are you going to start selling your podcasts or um, putting your content on things like iTunes? So it's a really, really tough one to kind of gauge at the moment, um, but do start thinking about these kind of tertiary um, style uh, social networks. Uh, Google. Uh, I talked about uh, what they were uh, doing uh, a bit earlier. Uh, they already own uh, Zagat. Uh, these are purchases that they've done over the last eight months or so. Um, they bought uh, Katango, which automatically uh, circles your friends. It, it automatically groups all your friends into natural groups, um, something that was originally designed just for Facebook, but Google bought them, so they'll be integrating that into Google Plus very soon. Uh, they bought Motorola, a huge, huge purchase. Uh, a, a ticket into the, the patent wars, uh, ideal for their Android platform. So uh, the natural patterns here to kind of really promote and push their mobile um, side of things and their social network side of things. Um, as well as that, on the right-hand side, that's all the kind of production side. On the left-hand side of this um, chart, uh, things like Rights Flow, uh, TXV, CleverSense are analytical and monetization uh, platforms which will then start to sit on uh, their mobile um, uh, platforms like Android uh, and also advertising on iPhone and Windows Mobile. So if you do a search in future, uh, you'll be running yourself actually through one of these platforms. Uh, so as well as kind of looking at the content and creative side of things, Google have also looked at how to actually make money out of it at the same time. So they've been key with that in, in all their kind of uh, purchasing decisions over the last eight or nine months, and something that's likely to go forward. Uh, next up is uh, something called uh, dual screening. Um, who here uh, watched The Apprentice last night? Okay. Out of all of you guys who just put your hand up, how many of you tweeted while The Apprentice was up? Okay, so again, uh, I'm an early adopter. <laughs> But uh, it's something that is um, uh, becoming more mainstream. Uh, a lot more people are tweeting and engaging with programs uh, while they're airing. So things like Question Time uh, or The Only Way is Essex, they have hashtags that come up allowing you to chat and uh, talk to other random people who are watching the same program at the same time about the program that you're watching. So um, Sky have come out with an application uh, uh, which is being advertised very, very heavily at the moment, although no one really knows what it does. Uh, it's basically an aggregator of things that come through on Twitter and Facebook of content that's uh, to do with that particular show or program. So um, you have a TV guide that's live and what's coming up, and you can click on the channel that you want to engage with, uh, and it will give you a live feed with all the appropriate hashtags 
uh, so that you can just directly type in on this particular platform to engage with other people. Uh, There's something that's becoming more commonplace um, and it brings back the importance of watching something uh, which is aired first time rather than watching it on demand later on. So it's a really strong connection between social media and TV programming. Uh, and something that Coca-Cola did earlier on in the year in February for the Super Bowl uh, was one to uh, take a very expensive uh, Super, Super Bowl halftime slot. It was the most expensive ad space on the planet. And uh, they wanted to extend that 30 second slot into something that would keep their users engaged. So they closed the user journey uh, with social media. And what they did was uh, create an application uh, and a mobile site um, on all platforms, iPad, iPhone, Android devices, uh, which allowed you to uh, be supported alongside with uh, polar bears and penguins. So there were two uh, main polar bears, uh, the two antagonists of the story, and each one of them uh, supported one of the American football teams that were playing in the finals, the Super Bowl. And uh, when one of the teams scored, uh, the polar bear would come up and start cheering, a penguin would start running along and cheering too. Uh, at the beginning uh, of the whole Super Bowl when the National Anthem was playing, they stood up and put their arm across their chest and were singing along alongside with a penguin, quite random. Um, but uh, it's something that is becoming increasingly important when uh, you're running any kind of advertising in this space. If you want to continue um, a more efficient kind of spend with your TV campaign or your TV advertising, uh, then social media is a great way to go. Uh, and there's so many different kind of avenues you can go down uh, in this kind of space. Um, another big one that came out in February, uh, well, it came out before February. It's been around for a couple of years now. Uh, but it's only kind of really taken off uh, since the beginning of the year. It's something called Pinterest, uh, which is a virtual pin board of things you like around the internet. So um, you install this uh, Pinterest button on your toolbar, on your browser, and when you see something you like, any kind of content you like anywhere on the internet, you click your Pinterest button, it captures the image uh, that you see there and then and pulls it into your virtual pin board. Other people that can then view your pin board uh, and then take the content from your pin board and repin it uh, onto their channels on, on Pinterest. So that's kind of how the mechanism works. It's quite a straightforward mechanism. Um, if I search for something like London Bridge, uh, you can see that there are loads and loads of content. Uh, this is um, just a, a small portion of London Bridge photos. Uh, but all of these types of content, even though people don't know uh, these people, uh, they will repin this kind of content on their own channels. Uh, so uh, the top one here has got 52 repins, another one's got 27. Uh, and these are quite, um, you know, uh, unrelated uh, repins. So it's a really, really cool mechanism to kind of get your brand out there through, uh, again, visualization and uh, visual aids. Uh, if you have some really cool content, then why not get it up on Pinterest and encourage people to uh, re repin it on their walls and to be um, affiliated uh, with your brand or, or your core values or your service. Uh, another really cool one uh, that's actually been around for about three or four years, uh, but again, it's just really, really taking off now, is um, something called uh, Get Glue. Uh, this is uh, really my profile picture. It's not uh, some sort of superimposed image on PowerPoint. Um, my CEO took that, so I had to uh, use it. Um, this is my uh, real life profile. What Get Glue is, is uh, uh, like a, a fan page for every TV show out there, every uh, movie that's getting released uh, on the cinema or on DVD or Blu-ray uh, disc, um, and every book that's been published. Uh, if you're reading a book, you can go and check in and tell other people that you're reading that book. And other people who are reading that book too uh, can engage with you in a virtual chat room uh, just about that book. If I'm going to watch The Avengers, I can check in and say I'm watching The Avengers. Uh, and I converse with other people who are watching it or just about to watch it or have just watched it so you can talk about how great the experience was or how incredible the Incredible Hulk was. Again, early adopter, slightly geeky. Um, uh, once you have um, uh, checked in, 
uh, a lot of the brands uh, have now uh, reciprocated deals with Get Glue, um, which allow you to gain a virtual sticker uh, for each of these check-ins, um, which look a bit like this. So I checked in uh, when I watched the Grammys on Sky. Um, when I uh, first went to the cinema and checked in my first movie, I got one of these virtual stickers. Um, but uh, that's very, very geeky. Um, what's maybe slightly less geeky, or some might argue is more geeky, is that once you have 20 of these virtual stickers, they actually send this through physically through the post to you. Um, so I now have uh, some Grammy stickers. I've got uh, my Avengers stickers and my Captain America stickers. Uh, and uh, I can um, you know, stick them on my shoe boxes or just uh, collect them on a ream. Uh, something, again, uh, which uh, is really, really uh, a good connection with, uh, with the more youthful audience um, or a slightly more early adopter audience, shall we say. Um, crowdsourcing is becoming a really, really big key thing. Uh, I talked about crowdsourcing with that Nike ID uh, campaign earlier, um, but something that uh, we did earlier on in the year, end of last year, uh, was run a crowdsource campaign uh, for Total Greek Yogurt, where we um, ran an ebook uh, campaign. Uh, we got uh, users of, of the Facebook page uh, to contribute their own uh, healthy yogurt recipes. Um, and we collated that, published it on uh, Kindle, and gave all the money to Action for Children. So it's a partnership that still exists for the two brands. Um, and it's something that's been quite a nice kind of mechanism to uh, engage uh, the audience, the, the people who uh, act actively engage with Total Greek Yogurt or Action for Children daily. Um, the book did really well. It got up to number three on the Kindle charts. Um, and so uh, no plug, but it's all for charity. If you do see it on Kindle, then uh, do download it. Uh, what's it called? The Total Greek Yogurt book? Healthy Eating. So just type in Healthy Eating on Amazon. Download the book. It's only 99p. All the money goes to charity. Um, Crowdsourcing-wise, though, something that's really, really kicking off now um, is crowdsource funding. Um, a company called Pebble Watches uh, were around in Silicon Valley. Um, and at the moment, all the investment in Sil Silicon Valley is all centered around new social networks. It's surrounded by um, new apps, new software, uh, new virtual goodies. Um, they didn't want to invest in anything hardware. So what these guys did when they struggled to find $100,000 of investment was go on a, a site called Kickstarter, um, which looks a bit like this. Um, and they offered incentives for people to invest in their company. So instead of actually owning shares uh, for investing in the company, uh, instead they would get uh, watches in return or a discount for a watch, uh, or they would get several watches dependent on uh, the amount of comp contribution to the company they made. Um, amazingly, in their first uh, day, uh, they raised over $1 million. Um, and uh, they wanted to run the campaign for five weeks. Uh, three weeks in, uh, I just checked it yesterday, uh, they have so far raised uh, $8 million so far through crowdsourcing uh, uh, funding. Uh, so it's a really, really cool mechanism uh, to kind of get started on this kind of um, uh, stuff. If you have a, a charity uh, or if you have something that you want to run as a standalone campaign to uh, get investment for, say if you're a startup, uh, this is a really good way to kind of uh, get capital funding. Uh, there are UK equivalents where you can actually give away capital uh, of your company, um, like uh, Crowdcube. Um, but there are also mechanisms uh, like Kickstarter where you can incentivize people with uh, products or services that you offer. Um, talking about um, smart watches, uh, this is the Pebble watch, by the way. Um, it runs on electronic paper uh, technology, uh, so the, uh, the face is always lit with the time, which is useful because it's a watch. Um, but it also does other things. As you can imagine, it hooks up to your Android or iPhone device and can download apps onto it um, to stay engaged on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, something that is becoming increasingly uh, more, at the moment, I'd say early adopterish, but uh, later on, this kind of technology will become more mainstream. So uh, something that is uh, already out on the market uh, is this watch here. 
Uh, it's the uh, Sony uh, smartwatch, second generation. Uh, they have actually had smartwatches in the past, but no one knew about them. Uh, do feel free to play around with it. I'll just pass this round. Uh, it tells the time, uh, first off, which is great. Um, but uh, once you swipe it, um, it's got things like my Twitter feed, my Facebook feed. Um, it's got things like my uh, Gmail. Uh, don't read that, please. <laughs> um, uh, and it's all getting transmitted uh, through Bluetooth from my Android phone in my pocket. Uh, I've checked it out. It's got range in this room, so you should all be able to see it. So I'll just pass this around. There's just a button on the side. You just press it, and then you just swipe across. So, um, so uh, uh, yes, I will explain. I'll explain all. So um, this diagram looks uh, a, a, little, a little bit more cluttered than uh, most of the other images that I've showed you so far. Uh, all the way back in uh, 1997, uh, Hong Kong, uh, the land where I'm from, um, came out with something called uh, the Octopus Card. Uh, over here, they replicated that um, uh, uh, last decade with the Oyster Card. Um, but uh, the difference in Hong Kong is that you can actually use it to pay for small ticket items. Uh, something that Barclay Card have uh, introduced through uh, uh, NFC technology. So I was talking earlier about these tags. Um, basically, there's a tiny, tiny chip uh, inside this tag uh, or stickers uh, that are around your tables. Uh, do you have a look for them? Tiny little stickers uh, with little um, kind of chips in them. And that's a technology that's embedded into your Oyster card. Uh, it's also uh, embedded into a new Barclay card NFC stickers that stick and attach to the back of your uh, mobile phone, uh, which is quite cool. Uh, OK, maybe it's just cool for me, but it's, uh, it's quite cool. Um, a few years ago, Barclay card uh, did introduce the One Pulse credit card. Uh, it allowed you to swipe through uh, as an Oyster card, uh, your credit card. Uh, and also allowed you to pay for small ticket items, uh, whether with Barclay card machines and supermarkets and um, pret a and and places like that. That kind of technology is increasing. Um, so uh, you'll find more places on the run up to the Olympics, uh, more of those kind of machines uh, available in places like this, for instance. You'll be able to pay for anything up to the value of uh, £20 uh, with this kind of contactless technology without having to enter your PIN. Uh, so, at the moment... Right. Can I ask you a question? Was this the tech... Um, at the weekend, there was something in the paper about scanners that people can buy and they can skim your card without you even knowing it, like just put it in your wallet or your handbag. Is this is what they're skimming. Yes. Which is great when it works, but otherwise you can lose a lot of money. Yes, it is, it is true. However, this technology... Uh, has been found so far to be unhackable. So even though you can copy the um, details, uh, it has been found not to, the, not to be able to um, uh, identify what that actual data means. So uh, the Oyster card's been around for a while now, so is the Octopus card, um, but that runs on a multi-processor variant uh, technology on RFID. I've lost most of you here. Um, <laughs> Uh, but basically, it, uh, it encrypts on the fly. Uh, it, um, it changes its security protocol uh, as, uh, as you keep going throughout the day. So uh, at a certain time stamp of the day, uh, it will give you a different code to another time of the day. So this kind of technology is secure-ish. Um, Barclay card, um, because it is a credit card, they still have to uh, assure, as if it was a credit card, that it's safe to use. So if somebody does use it fraudulently, uh, you can claim all your money back as, as if somebody nicked your credit card. So um, yes, uh, people can skim data for it, um, but at the moment, the technology is still fairly safe. Sorry to refer to newspapers, and some people still read them. I know you probably read everything on your tablet. Absolutely. Uh, I use Google Currents. Uh, it's a fantastic app. Uh, if, uh, if you have a tablet, iPhone, Android device, download Google Currents. It's fantastic. Uh, you can read the Metro paper before it even gets published. Um, uh, if you have uh, social networks, uh, uh, the, the watch is going around the room at the moment, but uh, it has things like Twitter and Facebook. And this kind of stuff is downloadable uh, through things like the Android Store or Google Play. Um, and um, iTunes, uh, and this kind of technology uh, which you see getting embedded into mobile phones uh, and getting stuck onto the back of them uh, will likely end up 
on something like that watch or something like this. Uh, Cambridge University, in association with Nokia, are developing a wearable, uh, flexible, malleable touchscreen. Uh, so at the moment it's uh, still in early prototype stages, uh, but basically this is what a touchscreen looks like without, um, without it being lit up. So um, if you imagine uh, that's uh, all the data on your, on your screen or different touch points, you can touch it in different areas, which means that in the future uh, you'll be able to wear your mobile phone in your shirt or your suit. Um, this is a huge punt, but I think that in the future uh, no one will have wallets anymore. Everyone will be carrying around this kind of currency in things like their watches or their shirts or their t-shirts, things that they have on them anyway. Um, there's a, a, a device called uh, Square, uh, which is this little thing that plugs into the headphone jack of uh, an iPhone. Um, and this is a, a company that is still in the funding stages, uh, but they actually have real life products. So you can go and um, get one of these straight away. If you sign up, they send you one of these devices. Um, and basically what it allows you to do is get a real life credit card, real life debit card, and swipe that card through the top of this reader. Um, and it takes that information through the Square uh, app uh, and it allows that person to pay for something on the fly. So if you're a market vendor um, and you want to take payment uh, in the middle of Camden Market, uh, it's been traditionally difficult to take card payment. Uh, this kind of mechanism allows anyone to take payment anywhere, uh, regardless of uh, the difficulties of location or having internet access. Uh, so this kind of technology um, is likely to get around $4 billion of investment. Richard Branson is one of the major shareholders of this at the moment. So it's going to be a, a really huge thing. Um, in the future, uh, something that Square have already been developing is the ability to store all your credit card details safely onto an application where again uh, you'll be able to just pay for things by swiping through NFC, Bluetooth technology, ARFID technology from your mobile phone or things that you wear um, uh, at, at any point of sale, any point of uh, contact with a, a seller or reseller. So uh, some really really exciting stuff coming up um, and uh, hopefully uh, I'll still be alive when uh, it all comes around. <laughs> Being an uh, early adopter, I, uh, I uh, will stay up to date with all the uh, latest in medical advances and uh, make sure that I'm <laughs> tip-top healthy with my diet of kale soup. So um, to take away, uh, if there are three things that you uh, leave here with today, it is to listen to your consumer. Put them at the heart of everything you do. Monitor what they are talking about, about your brand. Engage with them. And actually use that feedback to uh, actually help you develop your service better, your product offering better, um, and actually completely use this one-to-one -one engagement channel for your benefit. There is no other better medium to engage with people outside of talking to lots of people one-to-one. -one. This is a much more effective way of doing it. Um, I've got a picture of a mad scientist, and uh, that's not to say that you should go nuts, um, but it's to say that you should experiment. It's really important uh, that with any new platform, one, you should reserve your name on there, uh, and two, find out what it really does and what you can do with that platform, uh, so that when you form your campaigns, you have a much better understanding of what you can and can't do and the limitations behind it. So if you do use uh, an agency to help you form your campaigns, uh, that you're not completely bamboozled by what they're talking about, or you're not um, undersold uh, from something that isn't really rational. Uh, and the last thing is to really focus on uh, what your core values are. Really, really focus uh, on what's right about your brand. If you're a restaurant selling um, a signature dish of pig or Okay, pig is pork. So if you're selling anything to do with pork, um, then focus on um, pigs and uh, what they can do or uh, how you rear them or where you got them from. Um, if you're uh, Scottish uh, and you want to hone in on the Scottishness of your brand, then talk about Scotland and the values of Scotland or the history of you and Scotland or your brand in Scotland. 
stay really, really focused for your core values. So uh, to uh, finish off, uh, I told you I'd take some really, really big punts. Um, this is uh, the timeline up to now. In the future, I think that anyone probably under the uh, age of two, three years old now, who's got a kid who's under three years old? Hands up. Cool. One person. You childless bunch. Two. Okay, I, I, I am punting. I am going to say um, that your two kids under three years old will not ever have to own a wallet in their whole lifetime. So um, I think that is the future. The stuff I was showing you earlier, the stuff that's been going around the, the room, the NFC tags, uh, that kind of technology, the wireless technology, uh, the things like the smart watch, uh, that is the kind of technology and payment system in the future. Uh, also, um, Sergey Brin here of Google, uh, uh, at the end of last year donned his Google glasses. Um, it's basically a head-up display where he can go around a, a party um, and identify who he's going to be talking to uh, before he's even met them. Um, so, uh, obviously, we probably all don't want to be wearing one of these at an event like this. Um, it probably isn't the most attractive thing. Um, and, uh, uh, but this kind of technology, I think, will come down to the size of your bloodstream, a kind of nano size, where you can start to inject this kind of technology into the cortex of your eye. Um, so that you can, uh, you can start having things like Wikipedia just stored like a hard drive in your brain. So you can access this information uh, at any time you want. Um, so instead of having to go online on your smartphone, you can just engage your brain and find out anything you want. You don't even have to learn it anymore. So I told you they're massive punts. <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, so that's me, Kwai Chi. Thank you very much.